Take it away, Pastor John. Yeah, John's going to talk about Paul. I can't emphasize enough how, the uniqueness of this book. Where's my picture? Am I on there? There I am. Hi, John. Um, when we uh, started the book of Ephesians, we, we spent the first session just on an introduction to set up this doctrinal um, book because it has a unique message that explains the mystery. And I want to just kind of briefly recap some of that introduction. Um, this is the second of the great text books of doctrinal instruction for believers in the dispensation of grace. It'd be Romans, Ephesians, and um, Thessalonians. Um, the key note of the of this book is struck in the in the opening of Ephesians in the third verse, where he, uh, Paul says that um, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. That's unique in Scripture. Um, this is where he's revealing the great secret of the dispensation of grace, that individual singer, sinners among Jews and Gentiles are being called out and formed into the church, which is his body, in which therefore there's neither Jew nor Gentile. And that this church should be to the praise of his glory, of his grace throughout eternity. In other words, this is it, folks. For the rest of the ride, it's the church. It's the only way to be with God. To the praise of his glory throughout eternity. And not only for us, but it's an object lesson to, well, an object lesson, so to speak, as Bollinger says, to the supramundane rulers and authorities in the heavenly. Supramundane. The mundane is the ordinary down here. Supramundane is the celestial. Um, this in the in the spirit realm, uh, the rulers and authorities in the heavenlies. These would be the uh, principalities and powers that Paul uh, says that we wrestle against. That stuff, not not flesh and blood on this earth, but it'd be a um, object lesson to them. The, the 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 God bringing all together in Christ. Uh, the Jew and the Gentile, uh, for his glorious purposes, to, he to heading up um, in one all things in the dispensation of the fullness of times. Now, the, um, this was the secret that was hidden from ages and generations, we read in Colossians 1.26, which Paul was not permitted to make known unto the sons of men until until um, the period where uh, he, Bollinger refers to Israel's national probation. Um, this was the, at the, the point in Acts where Paul comes out to all the Jews um, about his message and that where they, they finally leave him and, and argue among themselves, completely have rejected the, this sect of, of, of Christians. And that's Paul's green light to sort of open up all the vents and and reveal the mystery uh, because the Jews have officially s signed off on having overtly, uh, overtly rejected Christ and his message. Uh, this is after the cross, even. They're still. So that he God was giving them that much grace. So now that they, they've um, turned their back on it, now it's Paul's time, and this is where he's revealing it in Ephesians. And Chrysostom said, who was one of the early church fathers who died in 407 AD, Chrysostom said about this book, he says, these lofty thoughts and doctrines, which, which he, Paul, scarcely anywhere else utters, here in Ephesians he expounds. So the Paul expounding on the mystery in this book, you we are familiar with these epistles because we read them over and over and over, and they tend to kind of blur into form one general doctrine. 
But you got to remember, this is the first time this is being mentioned, this idea of spiritual, you know, blessings in the spiritual places that we're blessed spiritually, that that is, uh, that is the destination, the spirit realm, the heavenlies, not kingdom on earth stuff. So that's, we, um, last week, we then delineated who those spiritual blessings that he's blessed us with. Um, and that is verses like four through 14. Uh, those various spiritual uh, blessings and why the spiritual blessings are important to us because we're we're so in, ingrained into us our physical needs the, our needs we have in this world the suffering in this world the death and dying in this world the uh, the the constant barrage of attacks from the enemy and his minions on on us all the time um, so we need we have physical needs here. But God answers our physical needs in something that he did spiritually. He's, he is spirit. He came from the spirit realm, sent us Christ, which is the answer to these things, regenerating us, filling us with his spirit, empowering us with the life of God, the power, the dunamis of God from heaven in us now to be the light of the world, to be the salt of the earth, to attract people to Christ, to be the uh, billions of, of, of Jesus's it was just one of them before that he had to go, went back to heaven, poured his spirit out into us and filling us with his, his power and his, his spirit. So that takes us to where we left off last week was about that infilling, which was where, and let's say verse 13, we're still in chapter one, in whom you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that, you after that you believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Until we're resurrected to be with Jesus or he returns for us, we are filled with his spirit, the, the deposit, the earnest uh, of, of the full redemption where we'll be divested of the body or the body would be transformed and be living in the spirit with him. So the verse 15 is where we start tonight. And Paul starts out with wherefore I also, well, the wherefore I also is, an, it, it's better understood if you say, well, it's on account of this, on account of what he just said um, about the spiritual blessings and that we should be to the praise of his glory, those who, who trusted uh, previously, and then in whom you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, and whom you were sealed after that you, where you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of, of promise. So here he it goes, it's, it's on, a, on this account, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints. I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you always in my prayers. Now, here is his prayer. He's going, I make mention in my prayers. Now we'll listen to what his heart was praying. Says, that the Father of glory may give unto you the Spirit. These are spiritual blessings. If you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, you're going to have no clue what these spiritual blessings are. You're going to have no medium through which those things are conveyed to you. It will be like an invisible man to you. Well, actually, this is kind of more like an invisible, invisible man because you see it. My point is that it's like you can be in the same room with the invisible man and you wouldn't see him. But if you have the Spirit of God, now these become um, vital to you. They become actualized. They become active in your in your life. Uh, uh, something that that you that you lean on and and learn to to um, to move in and to, to communicate to God through this this uh, the Spirit. So, anyways, Paul's prayer is that um, that we may uh, that he that that the Father of Glory may give unto you the Spirit. And then he specifies the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Well, God is light. He reveals. He is revelation. When Paul says wisdom and revelation, Christ is wisdom. There's not a spirit of this 
the spirit of that, the spirit of this. God's spirit is one. It is wisdom. It is revelation. It is love. It is peace. He's just describing what their need is and what the what is being provided for us in the Holy Spirit. So that uh, he prays that, that um, the Father might give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Capital H. The spirit reveals God, reveals the Father. And I pray if you're, if they're am I talking, me talking about being filled with the Holy Spirit, if that's just some academic thing, a checkbox, yeah, I'm an American citizen, I guess. Yeah, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, I guess. If it's sort of vaguely intangible to you or there's no kind of an experiential relationship with the Holy Spirit, ask the Father to reveal that to you. Um, and you will find that he will reveal himself in, in ways that are super mundane, you know, that, that it will, you will have more of a, of a, a presence. You will have more of a, an expansive understanding, a deeper, wider understanding of who he is and who these words, what, what these words are, what, what is being spoken to us through, through these scriptures. So let me move on. Um, the, it keeps going in his prayer in verse 18, the, that the eyes of, of your understanding being enlightened he prays for you to have the holy spirit you receive light you you are enlightened by him understanding being enlightened that you may know that you may know what is the hope of his calling he called you the father revealed uh, the son to you god calls you to him jesus is known unto you you're known of him he knows you you have this relationship he, Paul is praying that the eyes of your understanding, your faith, this is about faith and believing, not seeing natural things with your eyes. It's by believing him, by faith, that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, having that light and understanding, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. He's, in, he's inheriting us and we're inheriting him we're his children we've been adopted this is all a family affair now but we're called by his name uh we're in christ with him sharing his glorious relationship with the father us in him him in the, being adored by the father throughout eternity we are with him now verse 19 continues his prayer is continuing and what is the exceeding greatness of his power god's power is exceedingly great just by definition it's dunamis the greek word where we get dynamite from it's always more than enough and it's always greater than any other power in the universe because he is above it all and so paul's praying that we would know what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us. It's not just, oh, he's got this power. It's for you. It's the power that, I'm gonna keep my powder dry because Paul's gonna keep, he's gonna explain this a little further. What is the exceeding greatness of his power to us word in the King James or toward us who believe? The believing it, believing in faith, that is the mechanism that activates this power in your life. That This is what connects you to him by believing. Your, your thought life is all, in, it begins all in the natural realm. When you're introduced to Jesus and these spiritual things, you're being transformed and your uh, ability to comprehend things in a spiritual sense instead of just a, uh, mm, uh, a natural having your needs met naturally here you're conscious of your needs you're conscious of your sin so you're wanting to grow your faith so that you're not under the guilt and you're still struggling with an old nature and and all these just these, these the, the mundane things here they're answered by understanding the power the exceeding greatness of of that power toward us who believe because we believe what we've heard and that his power toward us who believe is according 
to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he, when he raised him from the dead. The power for us was focused on the resurrection of Jesus because that resurrected the second Adam to correct everything that went wrong with the first Adam. The first creation went south really fast. And ever since then, Satan has been having a heyday with us here. And God's been working his whole plan with the Jewish people to cultivate a relationship with mankind so the Jews would be the blessing and lead all of mankind out into Christ, into God's presence, ultimately was the plan. So the power it would, for, for, toward us was uh, who us believe according to the working of his mighty power, Christ, when he raised him from the dead. We were talking about the weather and about Judy saying, well, we still have some more winter. This is a wacky month in like a lamb out like a lion. And I guess it's kind of, I don't know, only we're only one day into it, but it was beautiful. If it's coming in like a lamb, it could go out like a lion. That's just the way, I, you know, I, my folklore in my family worked. Or it could, if it comes in like a lion, it goes out with the power of spring. You can't stop it. You cannot stop spring. It's one of those things. Just get out of the way. It's coming. Might not look like it. The flowers will get here. The warm weather will come and we'll be in uh, uh, balls on the beach pretty soon. But anyways, the power that he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead, Adam, on the, a new creation. All creation was really good. The first six days was all really, really good. It was very, very groovy. God rested. But he made that all for us. It went foul. It got all screwed up. So God didn't have to make earth yet. Although that's, happened, that's coming too. But he made another mankind in Christ. So he, he raised Christ to fix the Adam problem of Adam number one. Not only did he raise him from the dead, but set him at, at his hand in the heavenly places. God set Christ at his own right hand. He didn't just say, oh, there's a chair. You can sit on right next to me. No. He leads us by still waters. He causes us to lay down in, in, in green pastures. He rests us. He doesn't just say, oh, you can go and rest over there. He rests you. When you take his yoke, his, his, it's easy, his burden is light. It rests you. It chills you down another level. He relieves you of your care, the, the burden of your works, the burden of the guilt of your sin. He relieves that. He rests you. The seventh day of creation, God rested. Paul says the only labor we're to be doing is to enter into his rest. Well, here we see the power at work when he raised Christ from the dead and set him at his right hand. The new Adam is raised and seated in the heavenly places with the Father. Not on earth, Father. And, verse 21, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but in that which is to come. Far above all principality and power. How much did we learn prior to this book? about the wrestling and the struggle with principalities and powers, things, spiritual wickedness in the heavenly realm, the whole angelic conflict and stuff that is messing with us all the time. Get a, get a perspective on this. Seated next to the heavenly, far above all of this, principalities and powers. 
and might and dominion. These are adversarial to God. Adversarial to you. Because you you are of God. Now. Satan does not like you. He doesn't want you spreading the gospel. He doesn't want you working in love. He wants you to conform and be just like the world. If he can shut you up and make you get in, you know, in order, and just be like the world, take your orders from the world, you'd love nothing more than that. But in Christ, you're far above principalities and powers because you were raised with Christ and seated with Christ. Let me go on. Because he said that, uh, um, and has, he keeps going with this prayer, and has put all things under his feet. God the Father put all things under Christ's feet and gave him to be the head head over all to the church, the head of the church. The church, which is his body, the fullness of him in all. And we've but we, you, read, you read this, and then like five or more times of all things under his feet. Um, comes from Psalm 110, where my Lord says to, or my God says to my Lord, I think it's uh, uh, Yahweh says to Adonai or something, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Uh, it's the first mention of it in Psalm 10. Making your enemies your footstool. Um, in ancient wars, the, the conquering king, there would be a, a procession uh, the, the, through the town uh, with, with the, the victor, and he, he would have his enemy in chains. And um, at, at some point, uh, the, the king would put his foot on the enemy's neck on the on the, the evil king whoever the the, the 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 king who was victorious over the over the, the his enemy he puts his his enemy's leader the king puts his feet on him uh, so it's under he's got his foot under his neck so when he's sitting in the throne they bring the enemy before he puts him under his feet this is war victory war um, imagery so uh, when here in verse 22 and put all things under his feet it's a victorious stance what's he putting under his feet all the principalities and powers all those rogue angels who had been adversarial to him for whatever how many eons we don't know how time existed before it it all fell out under and affected this world but the point is It's true of us now because we are in Christ. It's no longer I that liveth, but Christ who liveth in me. We need to get that through our skulls because once we understand that, that is our belief because that's what God says and that comports to the spirit. The spirit is saying the same thing to us inside. I hope these words resonate with you. I hope you find the spirit in you answering back. Yes, 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 these things are true. Somehow we know deeper inside that these things are true beyond experience because the spirit is real. The spirit experienced this. We have that same spirit. Oh, boy. I don't want to bite off any more than I can uh, uh, explain. Um, so I'm going to end chapter one and then we'll look forward to chapter two next Wednesday, if that's okay with you folks. And this will give us some time to kick this around some more or share a testimony. If you have any questions, um, this is, it's so tragic that so many people never get this far in their Bibles. They're enamored with the gospels and they're sweet. It's wonderful. But like I said before, that's just the conclusion of the Old Testament. The new covenant is this heavenly state. So, Lilia, if you want to take the wheel and anybody want to chime in with anything to add or any questions or anything like that, floor is yours. Hi, John. Hello. We are open to ideas. There was a couple of things that, that um, 
that just popped out at me. Um, one fourteen, when they were talking about how the Holy Spirit is our guarantee of our future inheritance, yes. that reminded me because I'm always thinking this is how I think of God our Father as a loving Father. It reminded me of Deuteronomy thirty one six when he's talking to Joshua and he said, "Be strong and courageous." Don't be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. So that's what I, I, that's what came to mind when I read that because it is a guarantee and this is like legal terms. But yeah. really, what he's saying is, I got you. You're yeah, my child. Never, yeah, I'll never yeah. leave you. I'll, this, I'll, this, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. This faith. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Nice loving one. parent. Yeah. And then one more thing in verse 20, when again, talking about how Christ's work was done, it yeah. brought to mind to tell us die. It is finished, completed. Yes. And therefore rest Hebrews 4, 3. Yes. So right. yeah, that's what just came to mind. Yeah. Beautiful. Louise, I always love your comments and your sharing. I always get a lot thank out you. of it. So, oh, thank yeah, you. I, I also noticed that, like the legal terminology, like like we find in Romans, it's like very legalese. You know, like yeah. if if God did this, then therefore, like if this happened, then therefore, this something else must be true. You know, it's very legalistic, and, and not legalistic, but you know what I mean, <laughs> right? Legalese. Yeah, like legally binding and logical. But then also the intimacy of of a father who loves uh, a good father who loves their children, you know, so which is not, um, you know, kind of like the opposite of like legal ease. It's just that emotional tie and, and emotional longing that a, a good father has for their children. Uh, even the, you know, the disobedient child, the father is still patient and loving. So that's what that's what really comes across with those verses for me as well. What you said about the legal terms, the legalese in this, it's no surprise. Think about what Paul is defending. Think about what he's presenting, the whole argument that he's presenting before a judge, mm -hmm. before the accuser, mm -hmm. with, on the side with the defense attorney, with the, the mediator. If, if the, this loving relationship needs to be spelled out so that it's forever settled in heaven for all of the angels and all the fallen angels and all of the humans. All of this is displayed for eternity. So this his word is forever settled in heaven. It's a legal arrangement. He's not a man that he should lie. There was no, he, he swore by himself. There was no other higher name than he could swear by in his covenant with with man and in, in this whole process so now we have the highest court of the universe where this is being adjudicated and paul is the one can you imagine being paul you know here he'd been a jew persecuting a zealous jew you know for the sanhedrin a pharisee killing christians consenting to stephen stoning there and He's on his way to go wreak more havoc on believers and personally blinded by Christ, personally revealed the mystery. You folks, most Christians don't even know there is a mystery to be revealed. They're still on the other on the wrong side of that. But when we begin to see the crack in the sky of what is being revealed to Paul, and then turn to us through Paul. It's, it's like the, it's like a Neil Armstrong thing. The first human to experience something. This is the first human to experience a post-resurrected Jesus revealing things that no man had ever heard before or knew before. That God kept it a secret. God's handling this legally. For it to be settled, I I dig the fact that you guys saw this is the law 
This is not putting us under the law. It's using the law to justify God's grace and all of his actions. Because who's being sentenced here? Evil is being sentenced. Satan is being sentenced. He's going to be confined to the pit. He's going to be eradicated. He's going to be what annihilated. Where, whatever he goes away, we stay with God. Never to never to erupt in heaven again. I mean, in, in the universe ever again. So God doesn't leave one thing undone. This is Perry Mason on cosmic steroids. <laughs> Does anybody else have anything to, to share with us? Um, there's a lot to chew on. Judy, your microphone is off, just so you know. Oh, when I read the verse 14, and he says that he has um, gave us the Holy Spirit as the uh, earnest of our inheritance, you could think, well, for how long? And mm -hmm. when I I ran a little bit ahead, but I found that in um, chapter four, verse thirty, it has it, it's he says that and gave not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. So. Mm -hmm the Holy Spirit that sealed us when we first believed, sealed us until the day of redemption. So there is no doubt that at any point we can lose it, um, uh, low, uh, for some reason um, not have it, we cannot we cannot lose it we we are sealed until the day of redemption yes yes amen, amen. thank you anna yeah. yeah it's a deal it's a contract you put earnest money down on a house yeah it means you're committed to go through with a full contract and if you don't you lose the you lose that so god's putting his word and his own spirit in us until and, the redemption of the body, the resurrection of the body, the completion of this. Right. right. And and he's the truth. So he'll want back up from that. He's the truth. He's not a man. <laughs> he should lie. Amen. Yeah. And this is the only way that we are free to serve him. Yeah. Out of love. Yeah. yeah. Not, not by compulsion. Right. By, grace. Right. Works by love. Yeah. Yeah. That was beautiful. Does anybody else have anything to share? It just, it brings me back to um, all that, that we learned from Jim, but this Bible that I'm, I'm reading from is, is my favorite Bible that I colored to the max because <laughs> you remember how Jim say, you know, for the butts, you, you know, you highlight it blue and for the butt nows and, you know, he told us all the yeah. little things, but I have like, there's so many things that pop out because I've colored it so much, but it's like he he chose us, he predestined us, he made us beloved. It just goes on it. He he made us to abound toward us. It's just all these things that I highlighted, his power toward us. And then it goes, well, that's chapter two, but he loved us, he raised us, he made us. Um, it just goes on and on his loving kindness toward us. Um, it's just very cool. There's just, it, this is one of my favorite books too. We talked about it last week. It It is so packed. It's so with, dense. With, it's so granular. With, yeah. It is with, so uh, dense with, with good stuff. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. it is like a legal document. It's saying, yeah. okay, you want to know that you're mine here. I give you this legal document. Yeah. This tells you. Yeah. yeah. It's not for the Christian vegan. <laughs> there you go. It's meaty. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, it, it's been said Ephesians is the the pinnacle of, I don't even like to use the term Pauline doctrine, but I mean, just for yeah. the sake of clarity, 
Yeah. Ephesians has been called the pinnacle of Pauline doctrine because it really outlines um, the mystery and what salvation is, and it really clarifies it. And uh, it's ironic that uh, so many Calvinists, uh, a lot of their proof texts come out of Ephesians um, and, uh, you know, which, you know, that's a whole other topic, but, you know, Calvinism is, you know, against the whole idea of uh, free will and, and you know the idea that god is picking you know he picks this person and and casts this person out but um um there's just so much in ephesians i mean it, it just chapter one itself if you just go and look at highlight chapter one where it says he him he him it's all about christ and what he's doing for us so you just go with your highlighter like jim used to say and just highlight and capitalize uh where it says he and him, where it's talking yes. about Christ and God yes. and what they did for us, you have a Bible education that is is just incredible. Um, and and that's what really nourishes us through this. This isn't just academic. This is what gets us through the, uh, you know, uh, strained relationships, the the bills, you know, the uh, setbacks in life, the setbacks at on the job. I mean, Christian doctrine, it's not just to let us know who, you know, obviously inform us of our salvation and, and impel us to service, but it's very practical. You know, when we read this, when you're, you know, you had a bad day at work or your car broke down or whatever, you have a strained relationship. When you uh, feed on these words and you look at what God has done for you personally and what Christ did for you personally, that empowers you to, you know, uh, roll with the punches, so to speak, and to still be gracious and to still look on the bright side when maybe to the world, there is no bright side to your situation. Okay. But, but as believers, we can still cling to these promises and these uh, these facts about who we are in Christ. So um, I, I just love that about the entire Bible, but especially, you know, all the Bibles for us, but these epistles are to and about us and uh, where yes. we're at right now. So they are especially um, practical and useful and and enlightening for us. So, well, amen to that. The, the, this uh, the in Christ realities, you know, in Him and in Christ. It's not just Paul has a cute way of phrasing things. No, these are. They're each one of them are like fifty caliber bullets against death, against Satan, against. Um, the law against um, uh, unbelief, against the, the world and its systems, against the, the carnal uh, appetites of the flesh. They are powerful. They're, this is These are the hand grenades, the mind grenades that are there, knowing who you are in Christ, because as he is, as Jesus is, so are we in this world. This is why Paul's saying in him and in Christ, this and that is true of you, not in the sweet by and by. No, it's right now. These are spiritual blessings that have happened somehow in the spiritual world mystically that are true of us now. We're, we're, God is pushing back against death. He's defeated death in that resurrection. All That nuclear bomb shockwave that went out uh, in the spirit realm, when when Jesus came blasting out of the the grave, that sent a whole message that their days are numbered, their reign is over, and the the way that we get through that, the way that we push back against those forces that are opposed opposing us and opposing God, is by knowing who we are in Christ. Knowing that we have been raised. We, yes, we were crucified. We're identified with Christ in Romans. But now seeing all of the things that are true of us in Christ. Because they're all true of Jesus. This is who, It's in him that we have all these things. And he is the spirit of God. He's, he is full of this. He breathed on us. He breathed on, the, on his disciples. Filling them. Giving them the Holy Spirit. And then he went and poured it out for all of us, all who believe. These are really, really powerful. I, I really want to take my, our time. I mean, no hurry. It's a short. It's a short book. You can read it in one sitting, easy peasy. But let's let's take let's consider how this is such a pivotal 
book. It's not just, oh, one of Paul's doctrinal books. No, it, 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 it's progressing from the revelation of Romans 2. This is the, the this is a heavenly celestial destination is where this, where this is going. That's what this is all about. And he's laying it all out right for us. Oh boy, I used up too much time. Thank you so much, John. We really appreciate your study and, and this uh, outpouring of, of scripture. And um, it looks like the, the clock on the wall is telling us all it's time to go, even though we don't want to go. But um, Well, we I hope I'll see you all on Sunday. Because that way I can I can hug you and see you in person. Yes. So I see we have a lot of people here, but we don't have a lot of cameras on. So it's good to see everybody, Anna and Denise and Cassie and Diane and Sue Healy and and whoever else. I saw Doug was here earlier. Doug so was here. I, I love having you all here. This is so cool. Really, really, really cool. So I love you all and I, I have sweet dreams and I will see you on Sunday. <laughs> love you guys. Bye. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank Good you. Night. Bye bye.